test. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to take a moment and say thank you all for being here. We know you took some time out of your day to join us, and this is information that is super, super important to us, and anytime we have an opportunity to share that with the community, we want to take advantage of it. So we do appreciate you all being here. I just introduce myself, and then we'll kind of go into all, uh, the other, my co-instructors, and then at some point we'll step up again and talk to you about what we're going to 
talk about from our perspectives of our department. Uh, my name is Kevin Crawford. I am with the UNT PD. As I kind of joke all the time, I'm hoping the badge and the gun gave that part away though. Uh, what I do for the UNT Police Department is I'm the department's uh, community relations sergeant, which means I kind of come out here to these type things and it's my job to listen to and con uh, community concerns and address those kind of community concerns. So as we go through the presentation today, whether you have questions about the content or if you have any questions about anything whatsoever or have any kind of concerns, you know, that you just wanted to express to me about your safety or the safety of the community, I'm going to be around. Please take a moment and find me and let me know what those concerns may be. Um, I'd like to, at this time, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. McGinnis, the Dean of Students, who's just going to be my co-instructor. I'm your co-instructor? Co-instructor. Okay. Hi, everybody. First, I want to uh, tell everybody how appreciative I am that everybody has some kind of either green or UNT branding on today. So good job. It's being great Friday, right? Um, my name is Mo McGinnis. Yeah, Scott will worry about you later. Um, my name is Maureen McGinnis. I go by Mo. Um, I'm the Dean of Students, and some of the areas that I'm going to talk about fall under the Dean of Students area, as well as how well we work with uh, the Police Department and um, Emergency Management. So, Julie, next. Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Elliott. I work in UNT Emergency Management Safety Services. So today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, preparedness for tornadoes, fires, and medical emergencies. So we're really excited to be here and talk to you all about this, and especially with um, some severe weather coming in this weekend. Um, we, we feel like this is a very opportune time to have this uh, seminar. So thank you for being here. All right. So we kind of kind of talked a little bit about what we're going to be about today, but here is the agenda right there. These are the specific topics that we will be sharing with y'all, making sure that by the end of the day that you are armed with information so you can stay safe on this campus. I'll give y'all just a couple more seconds if y'all need to read it. All right. Emergency management standpoint, it's super, super kind of emergency type information. We never know when a storm's gonna happen, right? We could be in here and suddenly there's a tornado hitting the campus. It is that time of the year, right? So I'm gonna uh, point out right here that this is the room we are at. Um, and then if you look at the little corners right here, which is basically the stairwells, those are our marked uh, areas for refugee. And then I don't see a tornado shelter on here. Is it downstairs? Okay, it's probably downstairs. So, but for here, these are your evacuation routes, which will lead us downstairs, okay? So, real quick with the UNT, um, we have 45 sworn police officers that are certified by the state of Texas. It's essentially the education code that gives us our power. We have the same power and authority that any police officer in the state of Texas has. So basically, you know, UNT is the department we work for. UNT is our focus, but really, it's to, to go out and be police officers. In fact, one change for most police officers is we actually have a little bit more jurisdictional authority, okay? The way it's written in the education code, as you can see, in those counties. So basically, the right? What does that really mean to you as citizens? It means that the UNT Police Department doesn't have to stay just on campus to do our jobs. It means that if there's crime happening around the corner, we can respond because we are police officers like any other police officer. It means that if we need to conduct an investigation, and it requires us to go off campus to do our jobs, we can go off campus to do our jobs. But ultimately, because we work for UNT Police Department, we know that the campus community safety is our number one priority. So it's not that we're driving through the middle of downtown Dallas looking for traffic stops. It just means we're not going to stay just on our campus board. In our area to try to camp. Now, we are an accredited police agency. It's kind of a bragging rights for us. Um, the CLEO organization, the acronym right there, and you can see their little logo, is basically the largest national accreditation agency. They're uh, an outside third party organization that holds us accountable for best practices. They've established, established what they think a professional police department should be doing, and they're very detail oriented. Since that if we bring a suspect in for an interview, we will offer that suspect something to drink. That's detail oriented they are for the uh, best police practices. It's a big deal to get accreditation. Um, at this point in time, there's only 7% of agencies across the nation that are able to achieve that accreditation step. Um, it's, it's so difficult. Uh, that it's a process. We have to do this. There's no requirement. But we feel like we want to be a professional police agency, we're going to let the party person come in and tell us what that looks like. Then send to audit us every three years to make sure we are following those good 
484 standards, and then by the time you look at the substandards, there's about 1,200 different things. For it, show them in our reports, or we have to, we have to those things they less. Um, the ICLEA, that is an international campus law enforcement version of the organization. They focus strictly as in t the title, campus law enforcement. The truth is, the last time I checked, it says 22, but that's actually last. There's only 20 universities in the entire country that have a dual accreditation through both of these organizations. And we are one of those 20. As I mentioned to you before, for us, it's bragging rights. It's, it's great that we get to say about that. But what does it mean to you, the community? Is that about professional policing agents for this status. Like I said, they send their teams in over to this third party organization that we are following those best practices, okay? So this is a list of some of our safety programs that we have. All these programs are free. We love to come present information. We, we make sure our officers are full of information and, and have the experience to come and talk these type things and or the training. And we, I would hate at the end of the day to put my head down on a pillow knowing that I have all this information I could share that would protect someone's life and not have that opportunity to give it to them. So uh, if you're interested we like to present to groups, but honestly, if you and you alone want to learn one of these topics, if you send me an email, I'll make arrangements. You can come have lunch with me in my office, and we'll sit there at my desk, and we'll go through the content if we need to, okay? The only one I can't do that for is our self-defense training class, uh, because that training class, there's a lot of things in there. I can't do really one-on-one -on -one classes for that. We do host one of those at minimum one per semester. We're trying to get more instructors, because our stru instructors are certified in form of defensive tactics type school. Um, and so we're trying to get more instructors and as we do that we'll try to do two to three programs per semester uh, but that program has a lot going into it. it's a three to four hour program there's a lot of repetitive movements and a lot of things like this so that way you build up that muscle memory and you'll know how to protect yourself um, one way out follow us on Facebook and Twitter Zip Too many head shakes, no, but enough saying yes. What did y'all think of the blue bonnet photo yesterday? Did y'all see it? No, you did? Good, right? So, I hope so. I hope so. I definitely put myself, myself and uh, uh, Officer Kazi, who's also in the community relations unit, we put ourselves out there. We had some fun with it. Fun with this is we have fun with it like the back challenge that's happening across the state right now. Uh, we also use that as a, a resource tool to talk about, like, we have a self-defense program. If you're interested in coming, you got to sign up. Oh, by the way, we're going to be hosting events like pizza with the police and coffee with the Here's where it's going to be. Show up, you know. And then if I ad identify a crime trend happening in the, on the campus, I might not come out and say, hey, by the way, we're seeing an increase in bike thefts, but I may put out a post to protect your tips and we'll help make sure that your bike is still your bike and it doesn't get stolen. We you to share our information. You can find us real simple. It's at UNT Police. Okay. Yeah, so we just want to take a little bit more time to tell you about what UNT Emergency Management does. Um, you might have seen our vehicle driving around campus looks a little bit like the UNT police cars. Um, we can't pull you over, just so you know. Um, we're friendly. Uh, and um, sometimes Scrappy drives it around, obviously. Um, and we sometimes, you've probably seen us around on social media. We had our um, safe day selfie day on um, Wednesday of last week. That's a National Weather Service social media campaign. I wanted to show off some of the pictures that people submitted for that. Um, so I uh, just wanted to show off some of our work in the community. Um, but our mission is to create a culture of readiness by ensuring the campus community is actively involved in emergency preparedness. So that's why we do things like this, coming to present to you folks. We want to make sure that you are actively involved in your own personal emergency preparedness, knowing what to do in the event of a tornado, fire, whatever the case may be. Um, so we just want to be out in the community and um, encouraging you to think about those things. 
A um, little bit about our team, um, this is the people on it. Um, we've got our s director, Scotty, he oversees all of us. Um, Justin there is our emergency management planning officer, does some business continuity stuff, so all of your questions about that would go to him. Um, Robin, who's actually here today, is our international risk control coordinator. Um, then you've got myself, um, and then uh, Ronnie is our fire life safety program manager, and then we also have Chris, and Chris is the newest member of our team, so new we don't have a picture of him yet, but he's right here with us today, actually. Um, they do fire inspections and all things related to that. Um, but yeah, that's about our team, and I'll hand it over to Mo now so she can tell you a little bit more about Dean of Students. Thanks. So the Dean of Students office, I have an awesome team that um, switch mics. Oh. Um, an awesome team that helps me um, and helps our students significantly. Um, any part of the day, but uh, we're basically always on call. Office is always open from eight to five, Monday through Friday, to be able to help our students. Um, we know that crisis doesn't have a timetable or doesn't have a, a schedule, and so um, we do what we can um, during those office hours and then um, able to help other individuals as we can and, and when things arise after hours. So the different things that our office does is enforce the code of student conduct. So are students violating the code, and if so, how do we how do we deal with that? How do we um, hold them accountable, educate them on what's appropriate? Because we think that um, many times helping them understand the expectations of being in the classroom and being disruptive and, and not being disruptive and how that impacts other people's education. Um, but also we know that people are impacted by that. So paying attention to what other people do um, and how that in, in affects others. Um, we do our care team referrals. Does anybody know what the care team is? Who does not know what the care team is? Um, going back to 2007 and the, the massacre that happened at Virginia Tech, um, we, looking back the, at, a, at a national level, saw that there were possibly many different signs that if there was a constructive team that looked at s the student issue, um, could they have possibly prevented the, the shooting? And so um, what we have pop up all over higher education are behavioral intervention teams. We decided to call ours the care team. Um, because we want to wrap our arms around the student and see how we can help or wrap our arms around the community and see how if, if it's impacted if somebody's um, issues are impacting student or that group so um, care team looks at students faculty and staff that are threats to self or others okay so um, there um, are a number of different offices represented there um, the police department counseling and testing housing uh, the provost office um, my office and um, then at different HR, so if there's a faculty or staff issue, and then at any given time we could ask other people to come in and be um, involved. If we have a student who might be an international student, we might get international office to sit down and talk about that student. Um, if um, it's a certain employee, getting getting the appropriate people involved. So. Um, we also do a lot of education and address uh, sexual misconduct, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. Um, I have a survivor advocate that reports to me that helps all students that are victims of any kind of violence. It just doesn't have to be the Title IX violence. Um, to work on different issues. We work at the DA's office for protective orders. We look at um, getting them connected to our student legal advisor if it's somebody, the other person's off campus, or if we have somebody that might have been assaulted in their apartment, um, the attorney is able to help the student possibly get out of their lease in that apartment complex. So there's just a number of things that we do, um, as well as education and prevention for the university. Uh, we have a green dot program, which is an active bystander program we'll talk about in a little bit, um, and we kind of go from there. We assist students with issues, medical, car accidents, illness, family death, um, a number of different issues because we know that could impact them from doing well in school but also attending and, and being retained. And so how do we help with that? And then um, student death as well. I get all the fun topics. So disruptive students, how can that, why is that such a big deal? Well, I will tell you, um, it's something we're starting to see more and more of, um, many times because students may not understand the boundaries, or we might be dealing with a student that has um, another issue going on that we're not aware of. And so do we bring care team in? Do we look at the student? Um, every student, I look at, somebody says to me, well, you have 38,000 students, how do you keep them all straight? And I go, well, I have 38,000 different opportunities to be creative, right? And so how do we look at some of these things and, and pulling the student in, seeing what's going on? Do they understand the expectations? They might have been allowed to act this way in high school, 
right? And so do they know that that's not appropriate to act in the classroom? Do they have um, some kind of disability that they don't, they aren't aware of or that they're not getting accommodations for and they might need help? Or do we have to train faculty? to look at students differently. Um, we are seeing a number of students on the spectrum, and so if a faculty member sometimes has never um, had a student on the spectrum in class and they feel that they're disruptive all the time, we may have to coach them on how to work with that student and we will work with the student. Um, we've had that happen a couple times and they think that they are disrupting to the point that they want them kicked out of class. Well, a lot of times it's just educating and training people on what's going on and how do we look at that student differently. We do a lot of research, or we would do a lot of resources and coaching, so if it's something that an individual wants to handle and they don't want our office to jump in and, and we don't have to jump in, we can totally coach those individuals on seeing what, um, what's going on. We're also, we're also the people that will make sure, if you call us, we're going to make sure that students' rights are upheld. And so a faculty member cannot remove a student from class forever without due process. At a state institution, we have to always look at constitutional rights and amendments, right? And um, students have the right to due process because this is a property right coming to a state institution for school. And so a faculty member, what we do is coach faculty and sometimes staff too, if students are doing it in office locations, to say, um, you know, you are being so disruptive in class, you cannot come back to class until you talk to the dean of students office. And then that faculty member works with our office. We talk to the student, kind of see what's going on, see if what other resources they might need to do. Do they need to go to counseling and testing? Is there something that's um, triggering them? Those kinds of things. And work with the, each individual student as well as the faculty and staff to make sure that we're setting our student up for success as much as possible. And if there is a threat, we look at that from the, from the care team and the code of student conduct perspective. And so looking at each student and student um, situation differently. It is not a cookie cutter business. All of you in this room are very different and so are our students. And so really paying attention to each individual student and what they do. All students or all student issues can be reported to our office through report.unt.edu. Um, I ask that you use that system when you have to refer somebody for care team, for um, uh, disruptive students, code of conduct, sexual, sexual assault, uh, because what that does is alerts the right people appropriately, but also pulls in their demographic information from EIS. It talks to that system so that we get all that kind of stuff put together. When in doubt, give us a call, um, and you, we can talk and refer to students um, as necessary and kind of see what's going on. Um, care team, uh, I talked a little bit about how it got its start. I will tell you, we are seeing a significant increase in mental health issues in college students. Anybody surprised by that? When we started the care team in 2009, we had 11 students referred that year. This year, we are already up to 640. Yeah. We see a significant amount of students for threats to self. When I say 640, and I say threats to self for others, everybody gets kind of scared, right? Well, those 640, the majority of them are threats to themselves. We are seeing a number of students come to school already on some kind of uh, medication for mental health issues. Anxiety and depression in this generation are significant. We also know that they don't have a lot of mechanisms to cope. Okay, everything has been instantaneous since they grew up. Um, and so, you know, and somebody doesn't respond to their text message in two minutes, they're mad at them, it, it snowballs from a snowflake to an avalanche, right? And so, we see a lot of students that are struggling with these kind of issues. Um, we do not take the place of first responders. We had to tra train faculty and staff a lot when we rolled out the care team. Um, and I had a student one time in Discovery Park um, having a seizure and instead of calling 911 they called the care team I don't get a fast car legally to drive without getting a ticket I don't get a gun I don't get red and blue lights and I don't have a medical bag I'm not that kind of doctor right and so a training at everybody that we are not first responders was really important we are more either proactive or then if somebody does harm themselves what's the reaction and how do we help them we do pay attention we have mechanisms to pay attention to um, social media outlets and so if somebody um, 
talks about going to a certain area and possibly jumping, we pay attention to that. And we get that student in and we talk to them, but we also communicate with the police. We communicate with facilities in a number of different areas. Is there an area of risk we have to look at as an institution and make sure that we do the right thing? Um, you can get any one of us at care team at unt.edu, but again, I would really pr prefer that people use the report.unt.edu unless it's something you're just gonna walk a student over to our office. Um, and that's Union 409, and we're, we're all, like I said, eight to five, Monday through Friday, there to help people. Sometimes you have disruptive faculty and staff. I know that's usually not on this campus, but I wanna make sure we have that conversation as well. And so what is the disruption? Um, and my recommendation, because I am not HR, is that if you're having an issue with faculty and staff, you call the police or you call human resources um, and make sure that they're taking care of what they need to do. Has anybody heard about the Clery Act? Okay, anybody not hear about the Clery Act? If we can go back to 1986 when I was in high school, some of you probably weren't born yet, but don't tell me. Um, it, we had a situation back at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania where Jean Cleary was raped and murdered in a residence hall room. Her parents went on a crusade to look at what could they have known to make a decision should Jean Cleary go to Lehigh, okay? And they believed that if, as parents, they would have much rather known about some of the security and safety issues surrounding the campus and on campus. If they, if they knew that prior to admission and enrollment, would they have made a different decision? Okay, hindsight's always one of those things that we look at, right? And so um, what came out of that, first in Pennsylvania, was a law that um, made all Pennsylvania institutions um, make sure that they got the crime statistics out every year and share them. And then in 1990, it became federal law. So we have a Cleary team on this campus. Um, the three offices that, that run that are the police department, myself, and emergency management, risk management. And we um, talk about safety issues and are there things that we need to pay attention to, but then all of our Cleary stuff every two weeks. By October 1st of every year, we have to um, make sure that all of you get an email letting you know where you can find our campus, our annual security report. And these are all the different things that we have to do in regards to Cleary um, and making sure that um, the community as well as prospective employees and prospective students can find this information at any time before making a decision on whether or not they wanna come here. Um, in 2013, the Cleary Act was amended uh, with the Violence Against Women Act. And this added four additional crimes, although sexual assault was always there. Um, it just um, kind of streamlined it a little bit and reclassified some of the crimes. Um, but added dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking to it. Uh, this is also when you kind of, this was two years after the DCL for the Title IX, although that's since been rescinded, but we still do a lot of work the same way. And so Cleary and Title IX talk to each other a lot of times, and a lot of times they don't. And so making sure that we keep up with those two laws is really important. Here are VAWA statistics in regards to the national trend. Um, and these are at college age students. 80-90% um, of things go unreported to authorities. We know that rape is the most unreported crime, or that, yeah, unreported crime that there is um, because of some of the trauma that goes with it. I will say that after the Obama administration, the Me Too movement, I think we've seen more of that. And so when you, when you increase education, your numbers also start to increase. And, and we did see that on campus as well when we started to do more prevention and education work. Alcohol and drugs many times um, have some kind of factor with sexual assaults on college campuses. And so we do a lot of education around drugs and alcohol when we're also talking about sexual violence. Um, and that 90% of women survivors are assaulted by someone they know. I've been at UNT almost 22 years, and when we did a lot of education for years on sexual violence, we always talked about the stranger in the shadows. We gave out rape whistles. Well, how am I gonna use a rape whistle when it's somebody that I know? And so we've really had to look at probably the past five, six years, some of the ways that we were educating students and educating faculty staff about sexual violence and making sure that they knew this statistic um, because of the number of times rape happens more uh, with somebody that you know. Intimate partner violence, and is this mine or is yours? Can I keep going? 
Okay. Well, you can chime in anytime. I know you do. Um, intimate partner violence and stalking. Um, you know, unhealthy relationships um, at the college age happen a lot. And I'm just going to say they happen as adults, right? I've seen many friends in relationships where it kind of makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you see sometimes them interact. Um, you know, being possessive and checking cell phones um, without permission, finding out the password, checking out emails, um, constantly putting people down, um, all these kinds of things really are red flags in relationships. And I will tell you, we've had stalking situations on this campus that faculty and staff have intervened and probably saved people's lives. Um, it does come really close to home. And we are a small city, and we know this stuff happens in real life, so why wouldn't it happen on a college campus? We are way too big for it to not. So how do you help our students? Well, anybody in here a lawyer for the institution? Anybody in here counseling and testing for the institution? Anybody in here from the health center? Well, guess what? Then you all fit into what we call a responsible employee. If somebody reports to you that they've been sexually assaulted, that they are a victim of domestic violence, dating violence, or stalking, you must report it according to policy. And that is you report it to your supervisor and the Title IX coordinator. If you fill out the report.unt.edu, it's already taken care of. You've reported it to the Title IX coordinator and you've gotten the person to the survivor advocate because we have a system that triggers those individuals when there's a sexual misconduct report or a Title IX report that comes through and we get them the student, we get the student the help that they need, okay? And so how do you help them? Um, if you have the opportunity to ever invite the survivor advocate to talk to your staff and how do you help students that are victims of violence, it would be um, something that I would highly recommend. Active bystander education. We all have been in part of situations sometimes where we see something happen and we probably five seconds later go, why didn't I intervene? Um, and so we really believe that the University of North Texas that we should be educating and we should be active bystanders and step in when something's going on rather than just take this cartoon and um, look at it from the perspective of um, just watching what's going on. So stand, speak, and act. Uh, kind of talked about this, what's going on, how can we move forward. Do you want to talk about this at all? So, and then forgive me, I can't remember if it's on the next slide, so I'll get, a, get ahead of the game. But just to kind of promote, and this is something that uh, Dr. McGinnis' office kind of focuses on, is the Green Dot Bystander Intervention Program. Um, that's what we use here at UNT. It's been proven through studies across the nation to actually reduce uh, uh, violence on a campus. So if you would definitely, you know, kind of get ahead of the game, but if you'd like to learn more about that, and I'm, like I said, forgive me, I'll have to double check. I can't remember if we put a slide in here or not. It's a correction what we need to make. But, uh, you know, definitely reach out to her. But basically when we're talking about the bystander, we're, talk we're trying to talk about empowering you to do something. This is your community too, right? When you ignore violence and you ignore things happening, it may not have a direct impact on you at that point, but it's gonna have an indirect impact. Again, it's just going to grow, okay? So we want you to know that it's a community effort to keep us safe. The police department may be the tip of the spear of safety, but without citizens letting us know, like we talked about the concerns or reporting crimes, some of these crimes can go unsolved. Let's just take a hypothetical situation. Let's, take, let's just take something and let's say you have a coworker that you know is being domestically abused. And we choose to not reach out to some of those people because we don't want to get involved. It's none of our business. It's not, you know, I just want to not pay attention to it. Well, what happens when that domestic violence potentially escalates up into more violence on campus? Uh, and I'm just going to say, what if it turned into an active shooter incident? What if you got the police department involved when it was just a, maybe a dispute between a couple at your office, right? And maybe the police get involved at that point and we can intervene and or let's say it's a student. What if it's a student who clearly you work with that may be in an unhealthy relationship and then it escalates into a stalking situation that ultimately in, uh, escalates into a death, right? At the end of the day, as a community, if you were aware of this and you didn't notify the right people, you know, you have a responsibility. So now UNT, the look is, is that it's not a safe campus to come to. We lost our, one of our students because we chose to ignore violence. That's what the bystander intervention program is all, is, is what it's about, is doing something, okay? 
Um, the Green Dot and uh, Bystander Intervention Program is going to teach the three Ds. You can directly confront the situation. You know, um, let's say it's a party at a sexual assault, and you have an individual who's highly intoxicated. That you know, if they were sober, they might not go back to that back room with the person they're going to the back with. Well, maybe we go up and say, hey, I don't think this is a good idea. I think you should uh, stay here, hang out with me, and not go to this back room with this other individual. That's a direct confrontation of it, right? You could delegate. You could call the police. That's what dele the delegation is. Pick up the phone and say, police, I'm concerned about this particular situation. I feel like y'all, this person needs some help. Get us involved. And then there's the distract. I joke around with this particular photo, if you've ever been to my new hire. Instead of uh, hashtagging, or for, or for us old folks, pound sign, um, uh, instead of hashtagging things, they could throw eggs down at the individual with a knife, right? I guarantee you at some point when he realizes people are watching him and they're pelting him with eggs, he's being distracted and the violence is no longer going to happen. He's going to turn, look up and see, turn his anger towards them. Let's put it to a realistic to a campus situation. What if you're driving through the parking lot and you see a domestic violence potentially happening in the parking lot and you're in your car? Maybe you could just honk the horn. Man, I guarantee you, after that person realizes somebody's in that car staring at me, honking their horn, they're going to stop the violent act and look over your direction and start trying to figure out what to do. And oh, by the way, call the police in that situation as well. You can do more than one, one of the Ds, right? So that's kind of the bystander intervention. Um, we'll skip over the st stuff. Okay, I thought we had a green dot one in here. I wasn't sure. Uh, speed through that and kind of get through it since we've done that. Here's where you can go find more information about it. Um, Esther, Esther, uh, I'm not going to try to say her last name. I don't want to embarrass myself. Um, so Esther is the student uh, survivor advocate. She spears that. She does work for Dr. McGinnis. I encourage everybody to try to find out about this class. It's a great, great class. I actually went through it uh, and got trained in how to teach it myself, and I, it, I really believe in this program. You may have even seen, by the way, little green dots around campus. That's what it's all about. So, and just kind of, I'll give you the 60 cent elevator, or 60 second elevator talk. Imagine the, uh, an overlook of the campus, and every time a violent act happens, we have to put a red pin in that map, right? Now, imagine a map full of red pins. Is there anything that screams safe, and I feel good about that map? So the green dot intervention, we just got lucky that it's green, because, you know, UNT, but the idea behind the green dot is, is that you replace those red pins with green dots. Every time you do are a good bystander and you intervene and you stop, you put up a green dot in there. So now imagine taking that map full of red dots and you see a map full of green dots, right? That's a little bit more inviting to this campus and that's what we're trying to accomplish with the green dot. All right, now we're moving into definitely the general safety stuff for the police side, all right? So this is some general safety, just kind of a little quote from Einstein. I love that. It makes me feel smart when I put things like that in there. I need all the help I can get. Really what it comes down to, <laughs> it's okay, I did that a couple seconds ago, I was just faster with shutting it off. Um, so what really what it comes down to is, is we're all ultimately responsible for our own safety. I talk about this all the time. The police department can't be everywhere 24-7. We can't. Um, I was in patrol for about eight and a half years before I moved over to the office, and I was a proactive officer. I like to arrest people. I like to catch the bad guy, you know, the hero complex, like, da 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 save the day right? I was that guy. The truth is, though, is that a lot of times I'd be sitting there at a red light, and I had to make a decision. Do I go left, or do I go right? Well, I'd make the decision to go right, and I'd see the criminal activity, and I'd go be the hero, right? But what if I had gone left? Instead of catching the bad guy, or bad person, ultimately, I'm taking a report call from a victim, right? So we can't be everywhere all the time. That's the reality of, the, of, of law enforcement. But you can do things on your own. And we'll talk about some of those tips. These tips we're giving you are things that you could just live by, make it, make it part of your life, which will potentially help protect you. Okay? So let's kind of go into some of those things. Uh, I guess before we do that, we should talk about uh, the crime stats, what we look at here at the university. Just to kind of fill you in what index crimes are, index crimes are essentially kind of a national tracking system of some of your major crimes. Every jurisdiction is, you know, encouraged, not mandatory, and most participate but they're encouraged to turn over their ma like major type crimes numbers and sharing that with the, uh, the nation. And so this, all this stuff is out there on the internet. It's easily collectible. So we like to take a look at our numbers and compare how UNT falls 
compared to the other major universities. For years and years and years, we were able to brag of the major universities we had the lowest rate. UTA passed us up, and this last year, Texas State passed us up with some of the lowest numbers. But I'll still take where we're at. If you compare us to some of the other universities, like look at Texas Tech, a smaller university, and they double our numbers. And I should tell you, when you look at those numbers, there's one thing that I kind of intentionally left out of there on part crimes. Most of those offenses, like 160 something of those offenses, were theft offenses alone. So maybe not quite a major crime, but it's a crime that, the, that we would track under this. So the majority of the crimes we see where someone's victimized on this campus, in fact, are theft offenses. And it goes back to the following good tips to protect yourself from being a victim. The most often our thefts are happening because somebody puts their valuable item down and gets up and walks away thinking, I can trust everybody in this library. And it's convenient that we're in the library because this is one of those locations where people like to walk off and leave things unsecured and unattended. That just means that somebody else sees a crime of opportunity and they go forth and steal your item. But what if that person had a friend there and said, hey, could you watch my computer while I go grab a book or I use the restroom? And then they get up and leave. What if they don't have a friend and they just put their stuff back in the backpack, maybe an inconvenience, but put your stuff back in the backpack and take it with you to class? Staff members, what if we park, or in, and anybody, park your cars in the parking lots. When we talk about burglaries and motor vehicles, typically we're not talking about criminals who are smashing out windows. That draws a lot of attention to you. People look over like, oh my gosh, there's a guy breaking in a window. They call the police. It's much easier to go around and find that unlocked door and just find that unlocked door and climb in your car and steal stuff. So what if we just made sure our car was locked every time before we get out? It's doing things like that that can protect you, right? Now, I want to make sure, though, even though I talk about how we are a third of the uh, crime rates right here, I do want to draw attention in our ability to solve our cases, our, our, basically our clearance rate, okay? Um, we are obviously leading all the major universities in our ability to solve our cases. In fact, if you look at below there, you'll see the state average of solving cases is 18%, and we're leading it at 32%. Our detectives, I mean, like I said, we can't be everywhere all the time, but the good news is, is that if a crime happens, chances are we're going to catch that criminal and keep them from coming back to commit more crimes, okay? So be mindful of that, that we definitely lead the way. Having the high-speed and advanced camera system that we have on this cam uh, campus has definitely improved. Um, I've been here 12 years, and uh, uh, the VP of Administration, Bob Brown, kind of set an initiative off a few years ago that let's increase our camera coverage, and he invested in it because the university cares about your safety, and so as we've grown our cameras, our, our clearance rate has gone up a lot, and there are cameras all over this campus with more to come. All right, so campus safety, we've already kind of talked about it. Personal safety starts with you. I talk about trusting your instincts, right? How many of y'all been at UNT for, is today your first day at UNT? No? How many of y'all at least been at UNT for this whole semester? Okay, and last semester maybe, and a couple years before? The point that I'm trying to make is, is over your time at UNT or life in general, you've developed instincts. You know what is normal. Now I will say, keep in mind, there's normal and then there's UNT normal, okay? There are things that are a little bit odd. At UNT, it's, you're celebrated if you come to school in a Spider-Man costume all day, right? So keep that in perspective. But you still have developed those instincts, right? You know if something doesn't feel right. If your spidey senses are going off and telling you, I don't feel comfortable about this situation, start asking yourself, what is it about it that's making me nervous? And what do I need to do to make sure that I am staying safe right now? So you see a strange person hanging out in the shadows and your gut says, mm, then maybe we change our path of direction and we go a different way and avoid that person, right? If they're really, really strange and you're like, they look like they're harassing other students, maybe we go ahead and call the police so that we can make contact and investigate them, right? Stay alert to your surroundings. You always want to move with a purpose and may be confident, make eye contact, right? When you're sitting here down like this, you're like, oh, right? Nothing screams like that person's not paying attention and they're vulnerable more. But when you're up, right, you're looking, your head's spinning like, I see you. Yeah, I'm going to walk this way. That lets people know that you're paying attention and that they need to look for an easier target, right? So these are all self-defense devices that you can carry on this campus. Uh, I'll be honest, I go with a flashlight. If I had to put these in order, I'd start off with a flashlight, right? One of the reasons why I like the flashlight, anybody have any seizure issues if I light a light? Okay, great. So uh, all these other devices are great, but they do require you to kind of get up and close and personal, where like the flashlight, like look how bright it is, and all this light, 
if I saw somebody suspicious, I could shine it their way like, hey, I see you, so I'm going to go this way, right? Right? And there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, some people may be like, why are you shining that light at me, right? But if they, and if they really are suspicious and they start coming after you, here's where the seizure part comes to play, so close your eyes. This has this nice little strobe, right? I've let my fellow officers test this on me just because I want to see what happens. And as I'm sitting there trying to walk towards them and they're hitting me in the face with that strobe, I, I really got headaches and nauseous and started, couldn't see in spots and I could no longer focus. And all I wanted to do was to eventually get to the point like, stop that, right? So you can hit them from a distance. And we're talking about, what am I, a good 30 feet away, 50 feet away? I, I'm terrible with measurements, fair, fair warning. I think I'm six foot three, but I really don't know. Um, so, aw. Um, so uh, I, I really go start with the flashlight. The next device I definitely would uh, consider would be the pepper spray, particularly that brand. That's what the, we carry at the UNTPD. It's some of the hottest stuff on the market. You can go to Amazon and buy it for 20 bucks, okay? Um, the one, two tips I give you is one, Cage, you go out and test that pepper spray. You want to make sure it works. I'm going to tell you all a funny story, okay? Uh, so I bought some of this for my wife because for a period of time she worked night shift. And I want, you know, I love my wife. I want to keep her safe, right? So I bought her some of this pepper spray. So I take her out on this nice, calm day, a little bit of cloud overcast, but it was still calm, kind of a little sun, you know? And I'm like, all right, honey, hit the button and just, you're going to get a stream because I bought the kind that streams like 10 feet. And I was like, I just want you to hit that tree just real quick so you can see what it happens, okay? She's like, all right. So she hits the button. So instead of a stream, a cloudy mist comes out. And so I can see this little mist cloud. And then a freak breeze comes out of nowhere and blows a cloudy mist right back in my wife's face. So I am very grateful that she stayed with me. Uh, I tried to, had to do a little work to make up for that. But um, it's important that you test it because like I had, that was brand new and it didn't work the way it was supposed to. So you want to go out and make sure it works. The other thing is, is most people think you spray the eyes directly, but that's not an accurate statement. What you really do is you spray above the eyes, kind of like right here, the eyelashes catch it, and you follow a Z pattern, like zero, right? And you want to get up underneath the nose and around the mouth. And here's the reason why. Yeah, the eyes can burn, but people can close their eyes and sometimes block it and wipe it away. One, if you hit up here, the eyelashes and eyebrows kind of catch it as it slowly leaks into their eyes. But I'll tell you from personal experience, because I've been pepper sprayed more than I thought I ever would be in my lifetime. Um, not because I'm a crazy criminal, but it's part of becoming a cop. Um, but what's really incapacitating about pepper spray is trying to breathe. It burns and you're gasping for air where it doesn't hurt. And so that's why it's important that you get under the nose and the mouth so that they breathe in that fumes. And then it gets, that's what makes them want to say, I'm done. I just want to breathe without being on fire. All right. Um, we've kind of talked about all this stuff. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, create a safety plan ahead of time. I need to change that. It says at home, but always create a safety plan ahead of time. And they'll talk more about that, but essentially we don't want you to wait till the building's on fire to go to your boss and say, um, how do we get out when the building's on fire? It's a little late. We should have thought this through ahead of time, right? Um, lock your dorm rooms. Lock, lock, lock. I can't stress that enough. Lock everything, okay? Um, your cell phone's a lifeline. Um, don't text, walk, or drive. By the way, in the state of Texas, if you text and drive, it's against the law theme, right? Lock your cars, lock your bikes. Anybody here have a bicycle they ride on campus? Okay. So Robin, do you know about our U-Lock program? Amazing. So just so everybody knows, one of those, remember we talked about concerns expressed? Community member could express concerns about bike theft. End result was working with the Mean Green, mean green Fund and uh, Dr. McGinnis and the UNTPD. We teamed up and we essentially went out and bought a bunch of U-Locks that if you let us engrave your bike, we will give you a free U-Lock for proper security of your bike because those cable locks don't stop anything. We do more stolen bikes where cable locks are left on the ground because they got cut, right? Those U-Locks are what makes the difference. Um, understand that bicyclists, uh, when you're on the streets, you have to follow the same laws as a car which means you have to stop at stoplights, stop at red lights, things along those lines. Now, if you drive around on this campus more than a day, you know there's going to be somebody who's not going to follow the law. I want you to understand that it's not that we don't pay attention and we don't care. I've, in fact, stopped bicycles running stop signs while three more blew right past me. I can only, there's only so many of us to go around. The reason I mention this is, is always kind of just anticipate, what is the worst thing that this pedestrian could do or the worst thing that this bike could do? as you're driving around on the campus. And if you anticipate that and kind of plan on that, then guess what? If they do that worst thing, then we don't have a collision and nobody gets hurt. So just be mindful of that. But I assure you, we do go out and enforce the laws on that. So active shooter, uh, active shooter. So we teach run, hide, fight. Um, I will argue though, there is a step before run, hide, fight. 
It's going to be recognizing the danger. I put that in there after the Oregon Community College active shooter because I watched, uh, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about active shooter stuff. I study it. I, I learn whenever time. I'm a little behind because I've been crazy but uh, at work, but I try to pay attention to survivors' testimonies because I want to bring that information back to, to the community. And this particular survivor that I watched, she talked about how her and her classmates someone th thought someone pushed books off of a desk. And it wasn't until the classmate unfortunately stepped out in the hallway and got gunned down that everybody else in the class recognized that there was an active shooter incident. So let's go back to the recognizing the danger. There's been multiple incidents where you may hear gunshots, but what else do, is happening? Uh, there used to be an audio in here that uh, I used to have that had a gunshot and it was followed by screaming, right? So do you hear gunshots and then you hear some of the sound like gunshots and then you hear a bunch of screaming? Well, that might be a clue that this is an active shooter situation, right? Do you hear gunshots followed by people running away frantically from a location? That might be a clue that this is an active shooter situation. You have to recognize that danger is happening and then you ultimately make the decisions to go to run, hide, fight, okay? Um, real quick, run basically is removing yourself from the situation. You would not want to do this if there's a chance of running into the shooter. What I want you to get in a good habit of doing is no matter where you go is always be mindful of different exits. Right? Just because y'all came through the main exit in the library down there doesn't mean that there's not multiple exits all around this campus or all around this building that you can use to evacuate. You should always be identifying potential exits no matter what building you're in. Right? And then just because you, know, you can use stairs and, and windows and things along those lines. Okay? Hide, uh, this is probably one of the, the uh, a, good, a good option to consider. Okay? If you're in, decide that running could potentially put you into the shooter sites, then you need to go ahead and consider hiding, okay? So get in a room if you're not in a room. If you're in a room or whatever, once you get there, uh, get in there, uh, you're gonna lock the doors when they can be locked, but whether you can lock it or not, it doesn't matter because at the end, you're going to use heavy duty furniture. You're gonna stack all the heavy duty furniture you can in front of the doors, right? FBI did a study of 160 active shooter incidents from the year 2000 to 2013. 70% of those incidents ended in five minutes or less. So and the reason I say if you can't lock the door, you can't lock the door because either way, we're gonna create an obstacle. We're gonna try to make it harder for that shooter to get into our location, to slow them down, to buy us more time for the police to get to the scene. That's what we're trying to accomplish when we talk about that. You're gonna shut off the lights and you're gonna remain quiet. Because every little sound could be the sound that draws the attention of the shooter. Even the cell phone going zzzz, zzzz, could be the sound that the shooter hears that brings them to your room. So be mindful of those type things, okay? Um, fight. This is when your life is in imminent danger. Whether the shooting has started in your location, keep that in mind. Even though we say run, hide, fight, the shooting could start right here, right now. It is too late to run. Our life is in imminent danger, okay? Um, I show a video a lot of times, and I don't wanna give too much away because maybe you'll come to my full active shooter training, but I show a video, it's a, it's a really good video, but there's a couple little nuggets in there that I'm like, that's not what I teach. And this particular video has a nugget where like the shooting started and people didn't necessarily go into fight stage right away and the shooting started right in front of them. It's like it's time to, it's, at that point it's too late to run, okay? Um, so, what we're talking about. I know everybody here is not a fighter. I get it. I, I understand. I'm going to ask you a question. Please be honest. If I say, here's a pair of scissors, you got to stab that shooter when they come in here. Who are not my scissor stabbers? Thank y'all for telling me that. So here's my question to my non-scissor stabbers. Would you throw your cell phone at the shooter when they come in? Or a cup of coffee? Or a chair? Would y'all throw something at the shooter? And I'm not talking about t-shirts and paper and be like, uh, oh, I'm talking about like, we're gonna bombard them with stuff that are gonna hurt to get hit with, right? Would y'all do this? A natural human reaction is, is you don't wanna get hit with stuff. You, you're, someone throws something at you, you're gonna blink, you're gonna cover your face, you're gonna step out of the way. You're not gonna just stand there and be like, bring it, I wanna get hit, right? That's not what happens. Now, I'm not saying that, they can, that that's gonna stop them from being able to shoot the gun. But what I'm saying is, is as you bombard them and throw so many things at them, you're distracting them from having their ability to, to accurately look down the sights of their gun and aim while they shoot. You're distracting them from being able to be accurate with their shooting, right? In most cases, you're hopefully going to be able to stop them because they're going to be getting hit with so many things. They're going to be like doing this, like trying to stop, right? So you may not be a fighter fighter, 
but you're a distractor, which is key, key role. So your job is, is to distract. So if on top of looking for exits, you should always be looking like, what could I throw if I had to throw something in this room if it happened? What would I use? Be mindful of that. So who are my scissor stabbers? Who are like, I'll stab them twice, Sergeant Crawford. All right, cool. So here's the deal. Y'all look for your makeshift weapons, right? Uh, for the record, if high heel shoes, what do you got on there, Julie? Oh, that'll work, though. That'll work. High heel shoes, great weapons. Scissors, um, keyboards, a mic, a what? Pens, keys. Anything along those lines can be makeshift weapons. And so your job is, as a fighter is that while they're being distracted, because, you know, on the secret word go, the distractor people throw them, and then you're like, go, and fighter people go, right? And then what you do is your job is, is to stop their ability from hurting others. This can be accomplished by either using force on force or just simply getting the weapons away from them, right? That's what your job as a fighter is to do, and you do this. Anybody know how the Nashville incident ended in uh, uh, active shooter at the Waffle House about 18 months ago or so? Shooter comes in the parking lot, shoots a couple people, walks towards the Waffle House. A patron in the Waffle House uses a door, forces the gun down at an angle, grabs the gun, throws it behind the bar, and then fights the shooter. Did I say anything about it being stopped because the other guy had a gun and shot the other guy? What about Santa Fe High School? Anybody know how that, that active shooter incident ended? Coach used a chair. Anybody know how to say anything about the gun, a coach pulling a gun, shooting the bad guy? What about the, uh, and, and forgive me, I cannot remember the name of the movie. Clint Eastwood made this uh, into a movie, but it was based on the real incident in Paris or France, the train, right? Three military folks, guy with an AK-47, a rifle. Did they use a weapon or did they use their, their hands? The point that I'm trying to make is, is just because they have a gun doesn't mean that they have the advantage. The reality is, is if we came into this room right now, besides the fact that Sergeant Crawford would be in the front and telling y'all to run away, I would protect y'all. But the truth is, if I wasn't here, y'all outnumber that person. Y'all have the advantage of being catching them off guard. Force them to react to your actions because y'all came up with a plan. You have the advantage. You don't have to have a gun to match them. You can do it without those things, okay? Don't feel like that just because they have the gun, that means they got all the, all the tricks against you. Outdoors, I added this slide in there uh, in my training after the active shooter incident in Las Vegas. I watched a lot of survivor testimonies and one particular one that popped out where she's like, me and my friends hid in a bush for, for three hours, and which is not a bad thing. And I'll kind of talk about your options, but I was kind of like, oh, okay. And then I heard people saying, oh, I got on the ground and I crawled, got really, really, really low okay, but he was from an elevated position and gravity still matters, right? Like you're still going to get shot. So I was like, you know, I need to talk about outdoor, outdoor shooting. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to try to determine where the shots are coming from. You can do this by hearing gunshots. You can see flashes because keep in mind, I'm not going to go through the long thing to save time, but basically a gun is a mini has a mini explosion happening every time you pull that trigger, which means an explosion equals fire. And if you know physics, that all those things follow the path of least resistance, which means it comes out of the front of the gun. Like, so the faster you shoot it or the darker it is at nighttime, the more you're going to see what they call muzzle flash. I'm not saying that in your outdoors, you hear gunshots and, you, and you're like, oh, did it happen there? There? No, no, I'm saying you hear gunshots, you look and you suddenly see a flash, you know shoot where the shooter is, okay? Now you're going to find out if you're in the kill zone. If you're in the kill zone, and it's, it's, a, it's a crude word, it's a military word, okay? Um, if I'm standing next to Dr. McGinnis and sh suddenly she falls to the ground, and I'm hearing gunshots, that's a clue. That means that I'm in the kill zone. I'm where the shooter's looking at. Or if I see bullets hitting the ground here, or if I see bullets hitting the ground here, it means I'm in the shooter's direction of the kill zone. And I need to get myself out of that kill zone as fast as possible, which means I need to run this way or go that way. Let's say the shooter's here and I'm in the kill zone, then I'm going to probably want to run that direction. Or get, a, get, find, get as far away from them as I can, okay? Now, one of the things you're gonna look for is cover. Cover essentially will protect you from bullets. If I shot my gun at this wall right now, besides the fact that I just have to say, dear chief, thank you for the last 12 years, the wall's gonna take the bullets, okay? I mean, it's, it may ricochet, but the, my bullets are not gonna go through this. This is a solid concrete wall, okay? That is what cover does. It will take the bullets for you, all right? So be mindful of that, because like that glass, nope. This chair, nope. This podium, Nope, my bullets will pierce through all these things. Things like brick walls, heavy car engines, big trees, things like that will take the bullets for you. So when you're looking and you're running away trying to figure out where to run to, be mindful of that. Now, 
in the best of both worlds, you get that cover and you get concealment. Concealment basically hides you from the shooter so they don't know where to shoot at, right? So what you want to do is try to run something like a big wall that you can hide behind that will protect you and hide you. But if you can't find that cover, then at minimum, you need to go to that bush or that concealed location so the shooter knows not to look at you. That's why that girl in that bush survived for three hours during the whole incident until the police got there because the shooter didn't know to shoot into that bush. He didn't see, see her, okay? So be mindful of that. Um, that's gonna be our information contacting the police department. Obviously 911 is a great way. The way it works is it goes to UNT Police Department and then, uh, or I'm sorry, didn't Police Department for 911 and then as soon as you say I'm on campus and I need a police, it gets transferred to us. Uh, we can also text 911 now, okay? Uh, it's been a thing that's been in place for a while, and we've, we've put posts out to advertise it, but just to let you know, uh, don't send like LOL, JK, things like this. I don't even know any other of those little acronyms. That's pretty much where my, my uh, repertoire is. And then don't send videos and emojis and things like that. Just be 911 and then text clear. Need assistance for this reason, I'm here, okay? Uh, it'll go to Denton and then the four will to us. All the, all the 911 starts with them because they have their own firefighters and paramedics. We don't have that. So if it's a fire-related paramedic emergency, they'll go ahead and dispatch and then notify us. But as soon as you're like, I'm at UNT and I need police, it's gonna go, they're gonna transfer to us. We're, there's a slight little kind of transfer kind of game that plays, but it doesn't delay mu very much. Uh, real quick on reporting suspicious people. I just wanna make sure I, sure I was at. Um, it's important that you give us good details. A lot of crimes go unsolved because one, they'll be like, you're looking for a white male in his 20s with a black backpack. And that's what we get. Well, if you've been on this campus, you know that doesn't really narrow anything down for us, right? Uh, think of race, sex, and height first, and then start with the top-down description principle and just describe what you see. Hair, facial stuff, if I had glasses, glasses, or ha facial hair, or just kind of work down the clothes of the color, you know, the color clothes, the flashy shiny on the clothes. You know, when guns are involved, you don't need to know that it's a Glock 17 9 millimeter. Just say, it was a long gun or a short gun, and it was a black gun, right? And just keep describing every detail you see. And remember, if we don't know, we can't help you. Uh, I don't have time to go into all my stories, but there are so many crimes that happened on this campus that were like, man, if they had just called us as soon as it happened, we might have caught the suspect and kept them from being able to come back and commit a crime. It's not your job to figure out, like, well, a lot of the big excuses I hear is like, well, I just didn't really want to bother you. That's not your job, that's our job. Like, I would rather go to my boss and say, Chief, do you see how many calls we had? I earned my paycheck today. Than to tell Chief, like, nobody calls us. I don't know what to do, right? Just call us, let us figure it out. We'll, we'll decide whether it needs a police response or not. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Crawford, we appreciate that. Um, so now I'm gonna move into talking about preparedness for emergencies like tornadoes, fire, medical emergencies and all things like that. Um, so let's get started. Um, one thing I forgot to mention here, uh, just be thinking about this question throughout this entire presentation. Um, are you personally prepared for one of these emergencies? And if you're not, be thinking about actions that you can take to make sure that you are personally prepared, okay? Um, these things can happen um, any time of year as we'll talk about a little later. So just be thinking about this and take active steps to make sure that you are ready for one of these emergencies if they happen. Um, one thing that we really preach from the Office of Emergency Management Safety Services is having multiple access to multiple resources. So we recommend having at least three different um, communication methods for receiving emergency information. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these different resources and tell you how to access those. Um, and then afterwards, feel free to come up to me if you need help finding those or have questions. Um, the first thing that you should do is sign up for emergency alerts. So um, if you are a student or a staff member here at UNT, you are automatically signed up for Eagle Alert. Um, hopefully you've seen those before and you're already familiar with that. But if you have ever changed your phone number or email address, you want to make sure you go on to my.unt.edu to make sure that you get that information updated. So it won't automatically update, unfortunately. Um, but yes, and we send out Eagle Alerts for tornado warnings. Um, and for um, any other like active threats that might be on campus. Um, also, Code Red is the City of Denton emergency alert system. So if you live in Denton, um, even if you don't live in Denton, you can use uh, the UNT address in there to get alerts from them as well. Um, they, they work just like Eagle Alerts, 
um, except they um, tend to be a little bit more location specific. So if you live, you know, 10 miles from campus, um, but still in the city of Denton, it will send you alerts for your location specifically. So um, yeah, really great resource. And they also send out alerts for severe thunderstorm warnings as well. Um, and of course, Denton County has their own set of alerts. And I know a lot of people commute into campus. So if you don't live in this area, please Google what your city or county has to offer. So most jurisdictions will have some way to notify you of an emergency. So a little bit more about Eagle Alert. Like I said, you're automatically enrolled, but you do need to contact, uh, update your contact information if that ever changes. Um, there's a lot of different notification types that we send through Eagle Alert. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the desktop override that was tested, uh, I believe it was this semester. Um, so whenever there is a tornado warning, um, this computer, if there was a tornado warning right now, this computer would show a screen like that one in the image there. Um, so you'll get alerted in from that method, of course. Um, all the computers on campus have this override capability. Um, you'll get a phone call, text message, email, um, and also we have a social media account that is dedicated just to Eagle Alert. So definitely want to you know, check that out, follow it, maybe set it up to send you notifications whenever we send out an alert. Um, and then the outdoor warning sirens, um, I hopefully you all have heard these or are familiar with them. Um, they are tested the first Wednesday of every month, unless there is weather that day, then they are postponed. Um, but whenever you hear these sirens, um, go inside and tune into KNTU 88.1. They will tell you exactly why those sirens are going off. So, because um, usually, you know, it's probably a test if you're hearing it on a Wednesday and it happens to be the first Wednesday of the month. But um, if you hear them at any other time, or even on a Wednesday, it's good to check just to make sure that that is why they are being used. Um, but the city of Denton sets those off for um, any like severe outdoor emergencies or um, but usually for tornadoes or very severe thunderstorms that have hail up to two inches. So if you're hearing this, definitely recommend get inside. Also, they're loud and I wouldn't recommend being near them. It's probably good to go inside anyways, so you don't have to hear them. Um, we always recommend that people follow us on social media. We, monitor, we have somebody monitoring the weather 24-7. Um, we all take turns being on shift and monitoring the weather and updating these social media pages. Um, also, there's just a lot of great information on how to be prepared, so um, highly recommend checking us out. Um, that's at Mean Green Ready, and we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So um, yeah, with a lot of great information there. If you're ever wondering, um, like for instance, tomorrow there was supposed to be a football scrimmage, um, the spring game, but that has been canceled due to um, the potential for severe weather tomorrow. So that kind of stuff is the things that we'll share on social media, um, so be sure to check that out. And then the Mean Green Ready app. Um, this is a super awesome resource that we're really excited about. Um, it's available on your App Store and Google Play. Um, but basically, this app contains information, has floor plans for every single building that details um, where your tornado shelters are in your building, as well as where AED machines are located in your building. So if you've ever wondered, oh, well, I work in, um, let's just say, Chestnut Hall, and I want to know where I should take shelter in a tornado. That'll be marked on the floor plans that are accessible in that app. So highly recommend checking that out and taking a look at your building and figuring out where is my shelter area or um, also where is my evacuation routes and meeting, right, uh, meeting areas. So if you were to evacuate for a fire or some other emergency, where should you go to meet up with everyone else in the building? So super awesome resource, definitely check that out. Just search UNT emergency. The little icon will be a cartoon version of Scrappy and it'll say Mean Green Ready on it. And of course, check out our website. Um, all this stuff I'm talking about, there's information about that on our website. Um, and also we have lots of information on the various trainings that we provide. So um, maybe you're, you want to bring us out to speak to your staff or with a student group that you're involved with. Um, we love the opportunity to provide trainings and do presentations. So please check that out. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, we love coming out and doing things like this today. Here's a little picture of what our site looks like. And of course, if you want more ways to be informed, there are countless things out there. Uh, National Weather Service is our go-to for all of our weather information. Um, I already mentioned Code Red, but FEMA also has a great app that um, provides information on alerts in your area. 
Um, CASA has a radar system. Of course, local, national news, the list goes on. So if you ever have questions on more resources or maybe uh, a resource that provides specific information on one particular hazard, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we've got quite an extensive list, um, but these are really the big ones, kind of our go-tos. Okay, so I'm gonna talk really quickly about weather readiness. And of course, being in North Texas where the weather is very volatile and um, can be a little bit unpredictable, this is obviously a big topic here. I would say UNT is definitely at a high risk from experiencing severe weather. Um, so my, um, first I wanna ask, uh, when can severe weather happen? Do you wanna guess? That's correct, it's kind of a trick question. Um, but. Yeah, I don't know if anyone remembers, but two years ago, I believe it was two years ago, two days after Christmas, uh, Rowlett, Texas was hit by a tornado. Um, so even though we are in what we would call severe weather season, um, severe weather is not limited to spring months. However, it, it is at the highest potential right now, so it's definitely important to prepare. Um, but I like to mention that um, just because don't, don't let this be the only time that you are being weather aware. Um, you should be weather aware at all times. So, does anyone want to tell me what the difference between a tornado watch and tornado warning is? Does anyone like take a stab at it? Yes. A absolutely, yes, that is correct. Yeah, both of you are totally right. Um, tornado watch means that conditions are favorable, um, and a watch usually applies to a large area. So usually, um, like maybe all of North Texas will be under a watch at the same time. Um, whenever you're under a watch, just continue with your normal routine, but just be weather aware um, as tornado warnings are very possible during these periods of time. And so often a watch may be associated with weather conditions anyway, so it'd probably be good to stay inside, maybe reschedule your outdoor activities anyways. Um, but just keep that in mind. Whereas a tornado warning, as you said, means there is a, uh, either a tornado on the ground or there has been a rotation spotted via radar or trained tornado spotters. So the National Weather Service trains um, spotters um, through a Skywarn pro program and they are trained to go out and look for these storms and to report them back. So take shelter immediately if you are in a tornado warning area. Um, just remember when you are taking shelter from a tornado or really any severe weather at that, a lot of severe weather like se severe thunderstorm warnings, you probably should go ahead and take shelter anyways. Um, but the best location to be is below ground. If it's safe to be below ground, some basements here on campus, I wouldn't recommend taking shelter in necessarily. Check out those floor plans because it'll tell you where to go. Um, but you should be at the lowest level of the building if nothing else. Um, try to put as many walls between you and the exterior as possible and stay away from skylights, stay away from any kind of windows. Um, you definitely want to be as far in as possible. So severe thunderstorms, these are defined as storms that have winds um, at or in excess of 58 miles per hour and produce hail that is one inch big or large. This is about a close to golf ball size. Um, whenever you're under a severe thunderstorm warning, you need to stay inside and off of the roads. Um, these storms can be incredibly dangerous. There's a lot of lightning associated with them. Um, obviously, hail is another hazard associated with them. and they often produce tornadoes, so just really important to remember. Um, if you're under a severe thunderstorm warning, go ahead and take shelter inside and be prepared to go into your tornado shelter area. Lightning, um, this is something that uh, we also get a lot here, and it's not only associated with severe thunderstorms. Any storm can produce lightning, um, but if you ever hear thunder, go inside immediately and stay inside until 30 minutes after you heard the last uh, strike of thunder. Um, the lightning risk is highest as the storm is beginning and as the storm is ending. So you want to make sure to give yourself a window on both ends um, because lightning can be um, come ahead and stay after the storm has passed. So that's one reason um, if there's ever a football game and there's lightning, they will delay the game by 30 minutes until they have not seen, detected any more lightning on the radar. So um, stop all outdoor activities, go ahead and reschedule things or bring them inside, so. Hail, so these pictures here, I don't know how well y'all can see them, um, but obviously the top window is completely shattered and that bottom window has holes in it that are probably about three or four inches um, in, uh, 
what do you call that? Di radius uh, diameter. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know my ge uh, geometry anymore. Um, so whenever there is hail conditions outside, get inside a sturdy building and obviously stay away from windows. Um, back in 2014, we had a huge, huge hailstorm here in Denton. I don't know how many of y'all were here for that, but it broke out tons of windows. And I think the Walmart um, that is on 380 and it caused millions of dollars in damage to people's vehicles. Uh, I believe that picture on the bottom there is from that storm actually. Um, but interior section of the building is the best. Um, and then we like to put this in there, but don't attempt to measure the hail while it is still falling. It's not worth it, very dangerous. Uh, flash flooding, it kills more people per year than lightning and tornadoes, and we are very prone to getting these hazards here in North Texas. So um, turn around, don't drown, never drive through flooded roads. Um, six inches of water can uh, um, wash a person off of the road. Two feet of water can sweep your car completely off of the road. So um, especially in areas that have a lot of pavement and concrete, um, especially prone to flooding because the water can't be absorbed into concrete. Okay, I'm gonna quickly talk about fire readiness. Um, obviously fire is not safe. Um, so fundamentally that's what I'm gonna tell you, um, but training isn't over, sorry. Um, <laughs> fire readiness, uh, just, just remember that if you hear a fire alarm, assume that it's real. Um, I know that in some buildings the fire alarms will go off for um, either someone has pulled the alarm when they shouldn't have or uh, maybe there's some other maintenance issue that's causing them to go off, but there's really no way to know that. And honestly, if you wait until you actually see smoke and flames, you might have waited too long to successfully evacuate the building. So it's best to just assume that it is a real alarm and evacuate. Um, Take into account anyone who may have access or functional needs. Maybe if you are a faculty member or staff member who works with someone um, with those needs, um, talk to them about that ahead of time and see how can I help you in the event that we had to evacuate this building um, and just start that conversation. Um, and remember people wearing earbuds maybe not, not be able to hear the alarm, especially people sitting out in the hallway maybe listening to music while they're reading. Um, go ahead and give them a tap on the shoulder and say, hey, let's go, let's get out of here. Um, that's a safe thing to do. Um, if you ever need to use an extinguisher, this is how you do it. You pull the pin at the top, uh, you aim it at the fire, you squeeze the handle, um, and then you sweep at the base of the fire and that will put the fire out. So if you ever need to use one, if you ever want more training on how to use an extinguisher, let us know. Our office provides a really fun training, um, includes a simulated fire and a simulated extinguisher, and so it's a lot of fun. Um, contact us if you are interested in that. Um, of course, for medical emergencies, call 911 immediately. That's the best thing to do. Um, know and communicate your exact location to the dispatchers. Um, that way they can easily find you. Um, hopefully there's someone else with you there as well. Um, designate someone to go stand at the front door um, to direct first responders into that room. Because sometimes it can be, especially in university buildings with lots of small rooms and offices, sometimes it's hard to find these locations. Um, so send someone to help direct them to the right area. Um, know the location of your AED machines in the building. Like I said, that app I mentioned, that has a description of where each AED machine is in your building. So if you need help finding that page, let me know, but um, super great resource there. Um, and then render aid at the level that you feel trained or comfortable providing. So um, like I mentioned about trainings, we also offer a general first aid and AED training from our office. So if you want more information on that, once again, reach out to us. We'd be happy to come provide that. Um, but definitely, um, if, if you don't feel comfortable doing something, we understand, but um, do what you can to help the person who is um, you know, experiencing the emergency. Um, and I've talked about this quite a bit already, but we do offer lots and lots of trainings. Um, we also offer a Stop the Bleed training. Um, we have a safety coordinator program, so in every building we try to have a few people who have been trained um, to help in an emergency situation and to um, kind of spring into action when we need their help. So we try to have that in every building. If you're interested in becoming a safety coordinator, come speak to me after this. Um, we would absolutely love to, um, to set you up with an orientation for that. Um, and obviously if there's anything very, um, very specific that um, you're curious about and you want to know if we have training on that, just reach out to us. We, we are okay with tailoring 
our trainings and presentations for specific topics if necessary. Um, here's a list of lots of campus resources that kind of tie into what we talked about today. So um, I, I'll put this back up on the screen in just a second. But um, do you all have any questions for any of us? Um, also, we've got our general contact information up here. Yeah. The whole ego alert thing. Um, I am a single mom, and so been here 20, 22 years and keep looking at it. What I did was one of the second phone numbers I put in there was my mom's, so that if there was ever a situation where UNT had a catastrophic situation go on, um, she knew what we were told to do. Um, now, she would also get woken up at 4 o'clock in the morning when we had ice storms and school was closed. But I educated her, letting her know that, hey, you're one of my secondary numbers so that you know what's going on. And if I can't get to you, that you're not worried until I can get to you at a later time. And so wanted that's just something to think about, whether it's husband, wife, um, kids, whatever. Um, it might be one of those second numbers. Cause who has a landline anymore? Um, it might be one of those, those numbers that you put in there to kind of think about. Um, putting somebody else now if you do that educate them on why they're getting it right but it might be something for you to think about oh yeah uh, you'll notice a lot of times I'm out shopping I see uh, ladies with their purse and they're leaving their shopping cart mm -hmm. wide open or they'd be walking with it on their shoulders wide open. That's just opening it to somebody stealing something. And uh, also around your office, you need to be sure you conceal your purse or, or whatever. When, whenever you go away, put it in your desk drawer. Just don't leave it sitting yeah. around. Because locks keep honest people honest. Yep. Yeah, we would recommend like on the office and stuff, secure your stuff. And so, you know, if you have a door, lock it. If you don't, then secure it in a desk. Even at a police department, things aren't safe. Granted, they don't steal stuff, but they like to prank me and put things on my computer to embarrass me. So it's lock your doors. That's the trick. The other thing I would recommend um, is I don't allow scissors to sit out on desks in my office. Might be the nature of what my office does, but I don't like the temptation of if somebody's angry that there could be something or letter openers. So it's really funny because we always joke we can't find any scissors in our office, but they're usually in a drawer. Might be something for you to think about. I've watched Criminal Minds that, way too many times. That's a great point. Anything that can be a weapon, right? If you get somebody angry enough, all it could be is that op opportunity, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to say is we, we put this together not just to think about what you would do at UNT, but what you might do out in the public. I've raised three kids, and they know I get the seat that gets to look at the door whenever I go to a restaurant. Um, and the only time that it doesn't happen is what if I go to lunch with a police officer. I let them pay attention to the door. But those are things I pay attention to. When I go to Walmart, do I know where all the exits are? Um, kind of looking at the, um, the different, um, like you said, the purses and, and things like that. Where do you give opportunity, crimes of opportunity to possibly happen? Uh, so pay attention to that. Um, Amazon, when you, shoot, when you buy a number of things from Amazon, is there a place that you can tell the Amazon person to hide it on your front porch? Um, and those kinds of things. So always being aware of different things that you could be inviting crime to happen based on your behavior. With the purse, at, you know, like in a shopping cart, I take and I put the safety belt through my handles. That's just something Would I found. Mm -hmm. okay. That's just something I found yeah. was a way that helped. Yes. I was going to ask about um, preparing for an emergency at home. So, for example, I'm a staff member and I live uh, in an apartment off campus on the second floor. And so, if I or my coworkers or if I have students who live in off-campus apartments and are wondering what you know, where's the best place? for me to go and my apartment happens to be on the exterior so even my own mom was like you need to get to the <laughs> you know so what so how would I advise a student or a coworker on how to d make a plan in their own home is that something that they contact their apartment management or some other resource well the the rule of thumb for like tornadoes for instance is like I said that exterior room or as exterior and sorry not exterior interiors you can get away from the exterior and away from windows um, I actually saw just on the weather channel yesterday their recommendation if you have an in like an inside 
a, you know, an internal stairwell, that's the safest place in apartment complexes, for instance. Um, but uh, yeah, that's really the best advice for that. I mean, if you, um, it wouldn't hurt for sure to contact maybe the, um, the leasing office or whoever owns that property hey, do you have a plan for this? Depending on what size that the apartment is, they might have already done that pre-planning. Um, maybe they have a common area such as a like a laundry room or something like that that is very internal. They know that it um, has concrete walls or something that we might not know from, from looking at this wall back here that maybe behind those panels there's a concrete wall behind there. But um, I, I would recommend reaching out to them if there's questions about that or uncertainty. Um, do you have anything you'd want to add to that, Robin? Your older apartments do not have fire sprinkler systems in them, and a lot of them don't have fire. Well, they're required to have uh, smoke detectors, but if you can get into uh, an apartment complex that has an automatic sprinkler system, because that saves. It. Uh, lots of lives, it saves lots of property. Generally, uh, when fire sprinkler goes off, it doesn't suck the whole system off at one time, it's just where the fire is. And usually it's one or two heads that controls the fire. And by the time, a lot of the time, by the time the fire department gets there, it's already out. And so it saves your property as well as it's safer if you're asleep and something catches on fire and it controls the fire, you're gonna be able to get out. And that goes for y'all too. I'm talking just one side. <laughs> and and this is Ronnie Dobbs. He's our our fire and life safety program manager in the Office of Emergency Management and Safety Services. Um, and one other thing about fire evacuation, they recommend just getting at least at least a hundred feet away from. Um, from the building if you do evacuate. Um, so kind of designate your own meeting spot for like if you've got roommates or a spouse or someone who lives with you, you try to get together at least 100 feet away and then somewhere where you wouldn't be blocking or in the way of first responders. That's kind of the general rule of thumb for outdoor meeting areas. If you have a fire and maybe it's in another area of your, the apartment, it might be not involving you, uh, so your primary exit is going to be out the front door, typically in an apartment. If you get there and it's not, uh, it's blocked for whatever reason, you can, uh, don't go out the door. Uh, you put uh, towels, wet towels in front of it to kind of block the fire getting in. Go to the exterior window. Uh, that's the second means of egress out of an apartment or a residence. And stay there, let somebody know where you are, and then when the fire department gets there, they can rescue you but that'll give you some time just to, you know uh, using the wet towels is, is good and also you can go into a bathroom but just let somebody know where you are and I've got just oh sorry I didn't see somebody else had done the question. <laughs> Sir, you can follow it up there. in relation to the apartment so um, what if you live like on these like third floor, fourth floor, and you have a ladder, like one of those roll-up ladders, would you suggest maybe trying that? As long as it's, uh, I'd, I'd say probably the third or fourth floor is going to be, be way too high. You're gonna, there's not going to be any ladder that I'm aware of that would drop that far, uh, plus it would be more unstable. Usually the second floor down is about where those will work. Uh, so, uh, you know, the fire department can get to up to the fourth, uh, depending upon where it is, uh, how it's located, they can use aerial ladders to get up to the, about the fifth floor is the highest that they can go on that. But typically you use the interior stairs if you can. Uh, usually those type of occupancies maybe have uh, an interior stairwell that give you some protection. If you've got an enclosed stairwell, typically they have a two-hour fire separation on them, and so you're going to be safe once you get into there. The other thing I would recommend, and, and this is something we learned as a family, if you have any kind of gas in your house, so natural gas for your water heater or your um, heater or anything like that, to invest in carbon monoxide um, detectors. Um, I, my brother-in-law's father and brother were killed by carbon monoxide, and I, th I don't think we have that conversation enough, but for your home you know, personal security, I, I definitely think that would be something you need to look at installing and having almost as many as you would 
your uh, fire detectors, smoke detectors. Well, too, if you move into off campus housing and it's and you're new to it, just make sure that it's got all the safety equipment in there that it's supposed to have. In addition, the uh, HVAC or a heater and air conditioning closet, electrical panel closets, and so on and so forth. They're not storage locations. And if it's got a gas fired heater in there, especially, you don't need any combustibles in there, but they're just not storage locations. You just make sure all that is in good shape. I just had one additional comment about the, the apartment question. Um, I work in the Office of Emergency Management and Safety Services as well, and I just recently, uh, a week or two ago, moved into a second floor apartment that does not have a good shelter area. Um, so it's a temporary situation, but the main thing that I can say that I would recommend is being weather aware and having a plan. If you are weather aware, there are some of these situations that you can, you know, have a plan for and mitigate those consequences. So, um, tornado watch, severe thunderstorm watch, that's when you make sure your cell phone is charged. That's when you check the radar, take a look at your plans for the day. Um, if I know that, if it's not my weather day at the office, um, I'm also a student, I'm a grad student. So, if I know that there's a tornado watch, uh, instead of doing my homework at home, I might come to Willis and go to the basement and do my homework there that day. You can do some things and make some preparations beforehand. I also know where in my building to go in case it is one of those situations where something pops up, um, which can happen in volatile weather systems. Um, so I've got that plan as well, but then I also know where to go if I can plan my day around it. Um, and the second thing I will say, in, and it comes with you know fire weather, renter's insurance renter's insurance. Uh, it is a fantastic thing. It is affordable and it can make a very large inconvenience stay that way instead of becoming a disaster for your finances and for your belongings. So and if you have a house <laughs> and umbrella policy. Yeah, there you go. I wanted to get on to her question about the apartments. And it goes along with security too. It, we as a society has gotten away from knowing our neighbors. Um, so if you if you know someone on the first floor personally, you go to their apartment and their safe place, and it would just go along with the security too. You know, we all need to know our neighbors. I think, whether you're an apartment or a house, uh, I think that goes a long way with uh, knowing the neighborhood. Yep, absolutely. Some, something else too. Uh, the other day we had a car fire over by Victory. Uh, uh, Victory Hall, yeah, and uh, burned up four cars. And so you need to be sure that your insurance coverage, especially your liability, is enough to cover that many cars because the car of origin is going to be responsible for all the vehicles that were destroyed. But, but it was kind of a series of things that caused that to, to happen the way it did. Uh, we had a wind that day, uh, the first up engine from Denton Fire was out of pocket, so they had to bring in a you know second up engine, but it just it it spread to I think we ended up with about four cars being totally destroyed. All right, so just about out of time. Does anybody have any questions? Like I said, we want to make sure you have every opportunity. You know, are we good? We good? Everybody? All right. Well, I'm gonna hang out, and I I don't know about Dr. McGinnis. She's got a little bit crazier schedule than me, so she may be leaving, but. Uh, for those of y'all who don't like to ask questions in front of a crowd, we'll be hanging out over here. Yeah. Thank y'all for coming. Thank you. Good job wearing your green.